All right. Well, good afternoon. We are getting closer to the tail end. You've had what a journey, everyone. Thank you for, for those who have been here this afternoon, going through each of these panels, listening to these experts. As I told you at the beginning of the day, today we have a surprise. Um, it, it, this subject is so dear to me. I'm actually going to um, moderate this panel because it's one that I've been waiting for since I began this journey, which is over almost 12 years ago, um, I've written about it. Uh, I've been evangelizing it to see if it, it would event eventually materialize. And that time is now, uh, you know, shareholder communications is here. And today we have some amazing people that uh, speakers that have been already, they're doing it. And uh, lucky for us, they, we found each other because that's, it was meant to be as it is. Um, and they're going to share a little bit of the experience. But before we get started, it's always great to uh, have the three of you here. But first, uh, if you could take a moment to introduce yourself, Karen, let's start with you. Great. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, so I'm Karen Rands. My company is Kigaran Capital Holdings. And I have uh, worked with entrepreneurs and investors for, I guess, probably about 20 years when I ran an angel investor group. And we figured out how to syndicate without being able to do direct public offerings and the kind of solicitations that are able to do now. I shifted my business back um, at the beginning of 2011 when the writing was on the wall about, you know, the, the crowdfunding was coming out with the Jobs Act. And uh, Georgia was one of the first ones to start to do that along with Kansas with the um in the uh, interstate exemption for direct public offerings. And so it was always one of the things that I felt was the biggest hindrance to entrepreneurs in getting access to capital is being able to identify the investors that are outside of, you know, the small exclusive groups of angel investors and being able to, to control their communications to their potential target investors. But likewise, it was an opportunity for many investors to be able to um, to be able to create wealth where they had not been able to do that before. It was what we call the great democratization of the capital markets, and Reggae Plus was was really the first opportunity for any type of investor that had the kind of liquidity and the and the knowledge to be able to participate in what creates the greatest wealth, which is successful entrepreneurs. And so I decided at the time that I needed to provide education out there and provide a pathway for people to understand how to invest in these private companies as they were doing that. It wasn't just a video. And so investor communications becomes a critical part of that beyond just the start of so my book, for example, in Inside Secrets to Angel Investing is the book that I created to be able to um, provide that should you, would you, could you invest in entrepreneurs as an asset class and how to go about doing that. And um, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in Reg A plus and Reg CF as pathways for that. And one of the things that I advise my clients is that it all the activity that you do to create awareness about your offering, to attract investors, to great, to create trust in your brand. One of the prior panels, they talked about brand and marketing, not as important in that, but I believe that it's all very integrated into creating a trust because unlike raising private securities with angel investor groups, the odds are that those investors for those companies are never going to meet that CEO directly. It's even though it's a private security, it's like they're a public company because their information has to stand on its own. The communication has to be consistent in the same way that public companies do um, so that you can retain shareholder trust and you can retain that goodwill that you have done to attract that investor to begin with and that they trust you. And so what, how you communicate after they become an investor and a shareholder is as critical as what you communicate before they become a shareholder and investor. Because as has been said on prior panels today, odds are it's not the only money that you're going to raise. And your best source of that next investor or to reinvest are your current investors and then them bragging to their friends, their excitement 
about investing in your company. And the only way they re maintain their excitement is by how you communicate with them on an ongoing basis. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, let's start. Obviously, we want to get into the discussion and, and the uh, if you could, uh, Evan, please take a uh, take a short break to uh, introduce yourself there, please. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Oscar. Um, and uh, hello, everyone. My name is Evan Verriard. I'm, I'm currently the Vice President of Investor Relations for Flora Growth. They're a NASDAQ listed cannabis company. It's been several years now in, in um, investor relations role, initially working sort of on a digital space with social media strategies, and then uh, broadly across resource and cannabis, and then switching to the actual public and private companies themselves. Over the course of 2020, I led a, a Reg A for Flora Growth, which ended up being an oversubscribed $30 million Reg A offering, uh, and then subsequent a NASDAQ IPO uh, in May of, of this year, of 2021. And then I continue to serve as, as VPIR for that company today, as well as advise a number of different public, or public and private companies uh, in, in an investor relations capacity, as well as some, some Reg A's within that. That's all. Thanks. Thank you, Evan. Pierre. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me today. My name is Pierre Dubois. I lead Procore Advisory based in Houston, Texas, and we help companies position themselves best with key stakeholders, namely the investment community. And we leverage our uh, 25 plus years of experience as an investment analyst uh, on the sell side and as a investor relations officer for uh, publicly traded companies. Um, we currently work with startups and uh, what I like to say startups with the ticker. So those who are publicly traded, but in reality, maybe they shouldn't have been. Uh, and so we're helping them get back on their feet again. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Let's, I mean, uh, the, the idea of having three individuals that have experience is critical, right? Because it, it, it's the whole premise of why we're here is to provide education to an, to an industry, to a sector that really doesn't know what this is. So let's start with that. I mean, um, Evan, you and I had this great conversation and I'll come back to members. I mean, shareholder communication, it, that's not where it came from, but there's another term for it. And, you know, <coughs> let, let's start with you on that. Um, you know, give us your your interpretation of shareholder communication, how it's going to be applied to the private company world. Yeah, well, I think there's a, there's a number of things to, to look at. And, and Karen hit on and hit on some of those points earlier on. Um, but as it relates to shareholder communications, you know, in, you know, I think we when the, the conversation you're referencing is, is kind of the investor relations classic role with public companies and, and many private companies thinking they don't need that. But quite frankly, you know, if, if you're looking to, to raise capital and, and for early stage companies, you know, capital cash is, is the lifeblood of those companies. You, you need to have access um, quickly and conveniently. Uh, you need to be able to have a, a loyal shareholder base who's willing to reinvest. Uh, and then it's important to be able to have that, that trust built with them. Um, you know, whether you're private or you're public, you, you will need to actually have them understand the business, trust that it's growing, growing in the right direction, and trust that management knows what they're doing and, and they're good stewards of their capital. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, especially as it relates to tr traditional marketing, you know, you're not selling a, a product, right? Like you're, you're having people invest their savings. So this isn't just, you know, uh, buying a car. This is, you know, someone's future home someone's kid's education in the future. And so you need to make sure that you can gain their trust, that you have a sound communication strategy, sound business, you can communicate it properly, and then have them feel comfortable putting that, that trust in you as a steward of their capital to grow it moving forward. And I think that's, that's a key, key component in, of, of any business that's trying to raise capital, public or private, and, and to think that you can do that ad hoc without having someone who's dedicated to think about it, to execute on that strategy is going to be very challenging as, as anyone who's, who's been in a leadership role knows that a CEO or COO uh, is pulled in a lot of different directions. So it's very important to, to not let the shareholder communications fall to the wayside. No, I agree. And I, I think you touched on a really good point. I mean, we've known this role to be called investor acquisition, right? That was the, the term that 
uh, investor <laughs> relations. Sorry, my apologies. And uh, and it's associated with public companies. And look, you all know when in speaking to me, if that terminology, because most of these companies are staying private, we but they still need to have that foundation and uh, that they they need to carry on whether they are doing their primary. And now I'm, I'm going to come to you, Pierre, because, you know, quite a lot of companies will do everything they can when they're doing their capital raising. I've seen this. They hire PR, they hire media, they do all that, and they go, oh, they do all of that. But PR and IR and shareholder communication are very different. Um, and I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I have led... Um, IR programs, but I've also led corporate comm programs. So I think there's a lot of value when you have um, PR marketing and IR working together. We call that integrated communications. Um, but it's really hard to do all of that, um, as you said, Oscar, and usually that's relegated to the, the founder or one of the co-founders to do all of that. If they're lucky, maybe they'll bring in a marketing person. But I think we're having someone who has the background to assist with shareholders specifically where it helps is because they are able to um, integrate a conversation about um, finance and valuation um, and that sort of thing, which is really uh, one of the key talking points when you're, when you're raising capital. Um, and when you're uh, hopefully engaging regularly with your investors, you, you know, you'll have the quantitative side of reporting and the qualitative, right? And I think um, having someone who can, who can speak to the numbers and how they'll affect uh, the strategy of the company going forward is, is really, really important. So um, it's, it's the ability to weave all of that together um, to create a uh, a strategy so many of you heard that you know your story is your strategy right so and that strategy is going to have both um, uh, qualitative and quantitative factors that need to be communicated appropriately and and i think you know having someone on, on with shareholder communications allows uh the founding team to um have a sounding board about what will resonate with investors and what won't and, and, and just, uh, you know, from the from the experience in shareholder communication, and I'm going to break it down into the three stages because it, mm -hmm. otherwise it, the subject matter gets convoluted, but they're, the activities you do when you're raising capital. So that's one f form of shareholder communication, investor outreach. You're working with firms that you heard on the previous panel investor acquisition they're doing all that they're they're communicating digitally you're communicating with them alongside um is the strategy different the way they communicate at that stage uh pierre is it different at that moment well i think um so i think the first thing that every company needs to do is have a communications plan from ground zero so when you're in your room putting together your business plan and how you think um, it will resonate with investors, that you need to be thinking even at that early stage how you're going to be communicating your value proposition. Um, and then I think when having that uh, having a formal communications plan will help you regardless of the stage you're in. Your journey, the the journey that you take and the life cycle that you're in, well, it will need to tweak, right? Your, your plan yeah. will tweak along the way. But having that plan and, and, and updating it regularly, and then, of course, not putting it on the shelf and actually executing it, right, I think is what's most important. So it will vary. Uh, your goals will vary at, e at each uh, step of your journey. Um, and, and that's why you have to revisit it regularly um, so that you have um, a, a fresh approach. And, and when you have a plan, you can check off what you've done and refocus on your business. Correct. Yeah, no, I agree. I, but you brought up an interesting point, and, I, and I'm kind of coming to you with this, Karen, because I heard you say at the beginning, you've dealt with companies right at the early stage. 
And as I said, this is fairly new. I mean, if I went to the you know hundreds of thousands of companies we're dealing with uh, in our platform, I go, hey, have you heard of you know investor relations? They go, no, no, we're not public. See, that's the instant knee jerk reaction is private. And now introducing this, and a lot of them, yeah, we use PR just occasionally when we're raising capital. We're but this is different. What, what I heard you say is a, a detailed communications plan. So on that note, Karen, you know, how do you think the, the reaction or how should that get embedded into a, a company? Because obviously you're going to need it before you raise your capital, while you're raising your capital and afterwards. So I'm, I'm li like to hear your comments on that. Well, the thing about raising capital is that, you know, in it, it rarely happens like all at once, right? Yeah. And even with Reg CF and Reg A plus or any of these direct public offerings, it's over a period of time. Sometimes it could take a whole year in order to do some of these things because that's what the you know regulations allow for. And so at any point in time, there's investors in your funnel that are either have invested or thinking of invested or have just heard about you. And so if you have that communication plan, you can maximize that relationship and convert that relationship so that you shorten the timeline it takes for you to raise your capital because of the way that you're communicating. Now, what you communicate varies depending on where you are in that process, right? Because there's, as has been said before, there's some things that you have to legal wise, you can't overstate. You have to be really clear on your risks. You have to, you know, all of the aspects to not falsely sell the security and the outcome of what it is that you're going to do. And so as you create that plan and what, depending on the audience, what is it that you're allowed to say and what is it you want to say? You know, there's the legal requirement once you have closed your security on how you communicate on an annual basis. And those are also opportunities to further engage with your your shareholders so that they that you are in control the company is in control of the message and how that goes out there on all aspects of what it is that the company is doing not just financially but strategically and one thing that i found in raising and working with companies that were pitching to my angel investors and in following up with that Sometimes entrepreneurs will think that no news just means that it's good news. But to that investor that's wondering what's going on, no news is not good news. And you get a lot of grace with your current investors if you communicate whatever delay there might be in your milestones achievement, in setbacks, you might you, that you don't want them to get bad news after the fact or from somewhere else, or because it's a press release, or there's some other kind of information that's come out. You want them to be on the inside knowing what's going on so that they tolerate the uncertainties of how you progress with the, with the organization and how you're using the money that they have given you. And you have an opportunity to turn every form of communication into a positive encounter Whereas no communication can often be a negative event. Oh, I agree. I mean, look, I, I'm trying to define this. I'm trying to put it into a category because this door, this new chapter in the private markets is now open. It's now become critical. I, you know, we're all talking about the merits during the capital race. I couldn't, I think all of you have said continuously having a plan um, why strategically makes sound, uh, you know, to, to have this. And of course the, you know, from a company perspective, you know, when they're doing this, think about it. They, they got their lawyers, they got the investor acquisition people saying they can do this. But I really believe that this is a discipline. In my view, I'm seeing it as a discipline because if it gets pushed on. Uh, so let me explain to you what I mean by this. In the early days of the Jobs Act and all as it emerged, there was no such thing as investor acquisition. People thought it would just be social media and people that got in in the early days got in themselves into trouble. There were a lot of agencies that, you know, they didn't know the rules. They got in. They started doing what they knew best, marketing. But marketing with the legal twist, the securities law twist is very different. So that's why it 
it's great that you know marketing, but do you understand securities law to, to make sure that resonates well? And so why do I bring this up? Because here it, it, it shouldn't be grouped in with PR and all that, because otherwise the entrepreneur, in my view, will diminish the role and say, ah, oh, you know what, the other guys are already dealing with this. They're dealing with my key messaging and they are communicating with my shareholders and all that. But um, that's why I'm bringing the spotlight to this because it's now changed that narrative. And I'm going to focus now really with the three of you talking about what happens afterwards. So this is what we see afterwards, except for Evan's company, okay? <laughs> this is what I see afterwards. Um, Nobody's thought, you know, all the all the publicity, everything, boom, it's done. They've raised their money, boom, they continue, they 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 do their marketing, but nobody's talking to their shareholders, not as shareholders, they're just sending them marketing stuff. So Evan, obviously you're experiencing, you've had experience both the beginning and now you're part in the post. What strategies did you put in place to, you know, to make sure that the narrative was d directed at the shareholders? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few things to, to think about, and, and some of these points have been touched on previously. One one point is is consistency. Um, so having a good cadence of communications is very important. Uh, the second, I would say, is transparency. Uh, you don't want to be, you know, misleading your investors. Uh, it's only going to bite you later, even if you think it might give you, um, you know, some benefit now. It, it ultimately harms you more. And I think the third piece is simplicity. Uh, you don't want to have jargon or overly complex information being communicated. Um, you should you should have it down to kind of the, I don't want to say the lowest common denominator, but in layman's terms, I guess, if you will. And that will you know greatly help your, your shareholder base, particularly um, with retail. Uh, in terms of, of strategies, you know, the, the way I like to think about it is really about building a community. You, you want a, a loyal shareholder base. Um, so really treating them, like not not as a, a number or or just like a, a dollar figure that you can add uh, to your cash balance with with an investment, but actually as you know uh, people that you you can communicate with. You pick up the phone and you you talk to them, um, and so that that to me is is an important strategy. And you know, getting getting specific. I mean, this can look like press releases. This can look like newsletters. You know, weekly emails. Uh, it could look like webinars. Um, and of course, social media as well. There, there's a lot of different tools um, that are available to, to companies, either your, your, your shareholder communications manager or just, just the company as a whole. Um, and, you know, especially these days with social media, you want to make sure you're out there trying to control the narrative instead of letting the narrative control you. And you can do that by, again, issuing consistent, transparent, simple press releases and leveraging all the tools that are available to you. It's perfect. Thank you. And Pierre, I'd like to hear your, obviously, the, the strategy towards uh, the same question. You know, we're, we're done the offering. What's the strategy that I should be employing um, to effectively communicate with my shareholders? Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that after you've done your initial raise, is that you'll likely you know, if you're not already, even if you're a publicly traded company, you're always raising capital, right? There'll always be another raise, right? So you're always positioning yourself um, so that your current exist current investors might be future investors, right? Um, and I think it, you have a, um, a regular dialogue with your shareholders. It strengthens your competitive position because many companies won't be doing that. So if, if you can point to the types of things that you're doing with investors on that next capital raise, I think it gives management a lot of credibility. And as we know, management credibility is one of the top reasons anyone is going to invest in your company. I think, it, it, and as a, as a, a founder, co-founder, or part of, the, part of the team, when you're having regular dialogue, whether it be through, you know, a YouTube video or a newsletter or an email, preparing that communication helps you synthesize for yourself what progress you're making. When you when you see what you said last month and and you said you were going to do X and this month you did X. You know, that's a vote of confidence. 
Conversely, if you said you were going to do Y and you haven't yet, you can explain that. And don't forget that when you are fully transparent, as we've discussed, your network of investors can help you find solutions. I think a lot of companies don't think about that. And you have a huge network of investors. Um, and, and the way I like to look at it sometimes is your family tree. Your, your shareholders are an extension of your family tree, right? Look within your family to see who might have some potential solutions to the challenges that you're having. And um, now, in order to know that, you have to kind of have a pretty good grasp on who those shareholders are. And I think this is where the uh, CRM tools come into play. Um, you have a list of your shareholders. You have some notes on them. Now, that, that database is going to grow over time, right? And it's certainly going to help you to manage um, who these potential solution providers can be for you. So I think that's another way to think of these things is that the regular communication will bear fruit in many different ways. And, um, and so uh, doing so is, is almost a must for any company. Oh, no, I, I agree. And um, yeah, I'm going to come back to a question, but I want to hear Karen's comment on after it happens, what kind of strategies do you employ when a company's done? Now we need a strategy. Like they haven't even thought of this, to be honest with you. I mean, I think that's, I see that a lot. And, but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on it. On a strategy for communicate, continuing to communicate after they finish their race? I'm yes, like, because I, I think it can't be the same as the race. It just can't be because, see, they don't see the value. They, they go, I'm done raising capital. And I think uh, Pierre oh. was talking about you. There, I, it's like anything else. When people know what they're doing, they you know why. But I'm, I can tell you, I can... I can go through all the Reg A offerings. I can go through all the Reg CF offerings and I can see the, the weakness within the market. Yeah. Well, whether it's going to be to raise another round of capital or present, prepare yourself for an acquisition or to want to attract potential acquirers, it is through that communication that you do with your existing shareholders and with the community at large, but within that, that you start to set the stage for whatever that next step is. It keeps your options open and your biggest fans, just like customers are, you know, in theory, you wanted to do follow up with customers. You want to keep them engaged so they'll buy more, they'll upgrade and they'll cross sell, there'll be a referral, all that stuff. It's the same exact thing with shareholders. They have, you have sold them your equity. And so right. they are probably as important or more important than any potential customer. So the okay. same level of, of, of I, I'm sorry, the same level of, of care and concern and strategy that you do with communicating to your market needs to be towards the investors the same way for all the same reasons because of what the future is and your options in the future. Yeah, no, and I think I, Oscar, just just to yeah, please come add, in add one more thing. So, I think that um, <clears throat> there, there are different ways that you can communicate, um, different channels, different tools, right? But um, I think that the important thing to to remember is to. So I'll tell you a story. I I, I was in a meeting with uh, a large investor. And the CEO was talking and talking, talking. And, and finally, uh, the investor interjected and said, you know, you talk too much. <laughs> he said, you should listen to what I have to say. And I think that one strategy that you always want to implement is having a, a mechanism to listen to what your shareholders are telling you, what they're asking you because that's some of what you're going to include in your updates. Say, you know, I've been getting a lot of questions on our annual run rate on revenues. I've been qu getting questions on, you know, why we haven't added any advisors in a year. Well, you know, so listen to what they have to say too, or what, what their interests are, what their questions are. Um, be responsive to that. Um, and, you know, whether you do it monthly or quarterly, I, I think it depends on where you are. I think if you're an earlier stage company, uh, uh, more often is best because you're establishing your reputation 
um, with with the investment community, right? So um, I think you need to show that steady cadence that you know Evan and Karen talked about um, of, of communication. But but listening is really really important. I thank you. Uh, you know that's a great point. And guilty, <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> you betcha, I've been there. I, I'll I've been in that spot. And you know what I'm trying to do here. I'm I. I'm trying to. I'm not trying to pigeon the whole you the three. What I'm really trying to do is, like anything else, I'm trying to make it a discipline. I'm trying to make entrepreneurs who are listening in today why this is important, why this is different than what you know Jason Fishman, Dawson is doing, Andrew Cohen, all of them are doing, what the PR agency is doing. Because see, as an entrepreneur, I now know. I've had the pleasure of speaking with you know Evan and Pierre. I know that I it, it when you're running a business. You got so many things going on. You know what's, oh, look at all the good news. You got all there. But you know what we're not doing? We're not communicating to our shareholders. We, we are communicating to the community. And this is not another point I was going to bring. I don't know what you feel about this, but, you know, I, I recently, uh, they weren't upset with us. So I'm, I'm, I'm very transparent, uh, meaning that, you know, when, I, when, when we get it, you know, slap, okay, I'm taking it. And I, and I was listening. And their, their comment was, we haven't heard from you in a while. And I'm going, oh, my goodness, we're doing weekly emails. We're doing this. We're doing that. But what I, what, I was, what I got from that was you weren't sending me something specifically to me. Mm -hmm. You were sending me something like for everybody else, to all the gladiators in our company, to everybody else. And that's why I think it's so important. That's why I'm so passionate about what you guys are doing and how it needs to change in the market because the time has come because now there are companies with 10,000, 30,000, 60,000, 100,000 investors. And I think it was Evan who said it, this is someone's savings. This is their kid's education fund. We have a responsibility. Yes, we made it fun at the beginning. We made it empowering to, to, to invest, but we also have a fiduciary duty that doesn't go away and this is why I mean, you know, I'm I call it peeling an onion, <laughs> peeling the onion to get it to to bring that out, because if people think it's like something else, then it's not something else. That's what it is. That's why the messaging, I think I heard that three times from all three of you. And, and the only way I'll summarize it, it's not the same messaging you're using when you're raising capital. Once you bring them in the door, they're in the door. They're now stakeholders in your company. They own a piece of your company. Whether that representation is 0. 0.0000, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. They took their life savings, haven't said it, and to do that. So I'm. that's why I keep grilling at this because I want them to hear and understand this is the time you need to budget for this. So for those who have done this before, I'm going to go um, uh, with you, Evan. When how has a company strategized and understood that they needed to budget for it? Was that part of the leadership understanding? Where did that come from? I'm just curious because not everybody gets there and you've obviously been instrumental in that with some of the companies you work with. Yeah, well, I think it, it comes down to understanding the value of, of having a strong shareholder base and, and really putting a dollar figure on that, particularly once you're public. But but even before then, if, if you have intention of going back to your shareholder base to raise money, 10 million, whatever it might be, you know, you need to understand that you need, you know, they're an important tool. And, and if you're public and you know, I know this is more private focus, but if you're public, it's even more obvious and even more important because, you know, every day between 930 and four, you're being judged um, by your shareholders or by the market as to the performance of your company and your ability to communicate that and to have a good share price to be able to raise capital in the future is extremely important. So, you know, I, I, you know, I can't speak to any specifics on, you know, what should or shouldn't be spent or how dollars could, should be allocated. But um, I think, you know, you, you can con contextualize it by looking at, you know, future potential raises and understanding the value that having an engaged, loyal shareholder base can bring. Uh, in terms of, you know, again, budgeting, I think something that, um, you know, companies sh should understand and appreciate. And, and, you know, I know there's been a lot of different um, groups that have, have presented over the course of this, this conference, but leveraging service providers can be an exceptionally valuable tool 
Uh, it, it's a low cost, it's quick startup, you get experience, you get experts to be able to support you in, in your communications and your marketing and your capital raising. And so that should be something that, uh, you know, as a CEO or as a management of, of a company looking to raise capital, that you make sure you look and find, you know, the most efficient, effective ways of solving a need. It's not always hiring someone or, or building it yourself. It, it can be finding uh, a, a service provider who can, who can offer that immediate value. That's a great point. So, but it did start with the leadership inside the company um, to get it started. And Pierre, I mean, when, I mean, the, the success you've had with the private companies and working with them, did it come from the leadership? Did it come from the board? Did it came from a lead investor? Where did it come from for them to recognize they needed this external <laughs> element? <laughs> well, you know, despite the fact I think I'm a very persuasive person, uh, I've had, I've had, instances where I have, I believe I have presented a compelling story for having an element of uh, shareholder communications with a, a startup, a series A company, the two of them actually I spoke to recently, who, who in their own words said, look, I, this is a bear doing this shareholder communications. I spend 90% of my time doing this and I don't have time to focus on the business. I heard that echo. The second company said the same thing. Um, I haven't heard back from them. Um, and I think, um, you know, it, it, it's a challenge right now. I mean, you know, if, if that same company, uh, if I talked to that same company when they were maybe in the seed stage and I said, you know, 40 to 50% of companies fail, according to research, because there's no market need for their service or their product, right? So let's let's do the research and let's create this message that makes it clear to potential investors that there is a need for what you're doing. Well, now they've already raised a little money, right? And so maybe they've gotten a little bit too comfortable um, and they think that they don't need to change anything. That, that they can continue on the same path. But it's, it's at their own risk, right? I mean, at the end of the day, um, if, if you're not constantly managing your existing investors and uh, your potential future ones, then I, th I think, you know, you, you, run a, you run a very high risk of falling into that uh, failure rate. Um, and so, um, you know, I think some people see it. Uh, interestingly, I'm, I'm this month alone, I've been contacted by 25 companies who are in like series A, series B mode. And they realize, you know what we need? We need somebody to do this. Wow. That fantastic. wouldn't have happened a year ago, I think. Um, and it surprises me that they're thinking about it early. I'm pleasantly surprised, right? I think yes. it's a great, a great signal for, for us that, um, and investors, because I think investors see that these companies are taking it more seriously now, right? Agreed. Um, and, Agreed. And, and, and there's always there's always a budget that can be set aside either through an advisor on an hourly basis or a small retainer to do some of the work for you. Um, and so I think uh, this this panel, I think, will will go a long way in that direction to help increase awareness. Oh yeah, it's step one. It's step one. And Karen, yes, I'm bringing because I'm, you know, obviously you've been, you know, we talked about the capital raising. So uh, the the experiences you've had with the you you said you you've brought them to your investors. So where did when the engagement began? You know, were the entrepreneurs open to it? Were they that they understood it? I mean, because this is part of that journey, right? Well, yeah, it is part of the journey. I think the thing that you, it's a mental process that the entrepreneur, the founders, the, the C-suite has to go through that to, it's not one and done. You know, so many times they think of raising capital and we just got to get through it. It's painful. It's, you know, tough, all that. And they just want to get to the business to the Pierre's point, you know, they don't want to do these kind of things. And so it's, it's flipping the switch in the, in their brains to say, it's not, if you do it right and you make it part of your plan that the same 
pieces of digital communication that you create to to attract customers can be repurposed for working with your investors. And while you're preparing with your accountants and with your different people, your transfer agents for the communications that you're legally required to provide on an annual basis or when you complete your thing, complete your offering, you can take that and own the communication of it and the raw information's there that they can go to Edgar to look up or things like that. But you you use that information as a, um, a positive engagement with your investors and to what I said earlier, the same way you would with your customers and your potential customers. The same level of effort that goes into um, retaining, attracting, retaining customers is what you want to do. You want to have the same mindset with your investors. And then just it's a matter of taking the content and repositioning it for an investor flavor of it versus a future sales kind of a customer flavor of it. It's what we've done, what we're doing kind of a thing so that your investors gain even greater confidence and trust with your brand and with the founders. I mean, there's, when it comes to public companies, you know, right now we see a lot of, of stockholder activism. And I saw a, a statistic that said that there's, um, whereas it was like 87% of proxy voters will vote against the management in the past due to insufficient corporate governance and communication. And so it's the things that are, are per, are the, you know, people when they first invest, they're investing because they like your story or whatever it is that you're, that you're doing. But then they start to pay attention to other things that involve, whether it's environment, social, government, governance, it's the sustainability and the transparency that make them want to buy again or tell somebody else about it and say something positive about it. And when, right. when you are a big investor that's on the cap table or getting ready to look at it, there's, you know, a lot of times the, commu the investor community is a small community. And if a company has a reputation for not being transparent with their current shareholders, then it gives pause to future shareholders because they worry that this, this company is going to go sideways because they, th of the lack of transparency. And it's transparency is, on the oblig is, is, is part of the obligation of a private company Whereas with a public company, there are mechanisms in place to ensure transparency. But with a private company, you have to behave like that when you're dealing with a public offering, even though you're not publicly traded. And so it's really, really, it's, it, I stress it so much as a cost-saving measure to um, entrepreneurs and the founders that if they, if they invest in this as an ongoing part of their strategy that parallels what they do with customers, then they will save a lot of money and don't have as high, uh, as steep of an on-ramp when they get ready to raise their next round of capital. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great point you brought there, the difference between private and public. And I think this is one that I think CEOs that are listening in here right now, the biggest difference, and that was a great statistic, by the way, Karen, because I come from the public world and here's a typical CEO. He, he knows he's got, 130 million shares outstanding and he only knows his big ticket investors and that's it you don't exist in the line that's what's different about privates and public in the private every single shareholder sits on your capital sits there you know who they are john smith evan pierre karen and that responsibility is right there staring at you and you know it is it is great to begin this discussion i want this is what i'm going to this is my takeaway for the three of you because i'm telling you this is a great discussion. And not only that, I think it needs to be brought in early on. I think, Pierre, you said that getting these companies right from the beginning. Look, up until recently, the we, secondary market trading was this thing that that's the next panel, by the way, um, that, you know, everybody talked about, oh, yeah, we're going to trade. We're going to trade. It's only till now that it's finally going to happen. That door has now been open and people are going, OK, I want it. And they go, oh, I didn't budget for it. Okay, that's one type. But then the new companies that are starting the process, they're already adding it in. 
So for those who are about to start your Reg A, Reg CF, or Reg D offering, listen to what's happening here. You are going to have a CMO. You're going to have someone in marketing. But you need someone, even on the advisor capacity, as Pierre and Evan and Karen are alluding to here, that to guide you to make sure that you got a messaging specifically for them. I'm a big advocate of brand ambassador. I really am. But I also learned something very powerful this week. As much as I want everyone to be a gladiator, and they will be in, in what we're doing, I still need to treat my current gladiators um, in a certain way. I need to respect the fact that they are there and I need to you know, report to them in a certain way that treats them differently so I can listen to them. And that was my, you know, I, I need to be waking up. That's why I really, and I only have a very small shareholder base. Uh, mine is, you know, uh, under 100. Uh, now I'm thinking about my, my clients who have 10,000, 30,000, 100,000, and we're not seeing anything other than email broadcasting. And uh, so I think this is great. I implore you to start working on a framework. I implore you to start putting best practices. And we, as an ecosystem, will be your biggest advocate to it. That's how I employ you because the time is now because the regulations is, are being successful. Companies are raising their capital. Um, if they're fortunate enough to bring you in in the early days, great. But the reality is they need to keep retaining you <laughs> right through the end. It doesn't stop in, when you get your money. It now just begins. So, Karen, uh, Pierre, thank you. Uh, Evan needed to leave. Uh, he, he had another uh, meeting to attend to. So, But for everyone else, thank you so much. We're going to end this session. We're going to take a, a few-minute break. Um, you can see Pierre and uh, Karen and Evan um, on the lounge. You, if you have more questions, I'm sure you do. Um, we only scratched the surface today, but it is now part of our ongoing dialogue at Core Summit. It is now part of a new discussion point um, that we're adding and more surprises to come as, as our new summit because we need to make sure we hear from everyone. That was Pierre's word. We need to be listening to everyone. So thank you both for an amazing time today and look forward to seeing you backstage. Thank you, Oscar.